Uh, happy Tuesday, I guess it is, um, and welcome back, or welcome to our first uh, video of our book Chasing Vermeer um, by Blue Bellier. If you watched the little intro video I did on Dojo yesterday, um, you hopefully know a little bit about what it's about, um, but if you didn't, uh, these two kids right here, this is Petra Andali and this is Calder Pele. Um, they get together and um, attempt to solve the mystery of a missing Vermeer painting. Uh, so Vermeer is an artist, a famous artist, whose painting went missing and these two kids um, work together to try and figure out what happened to it. Um, so it's a mystery story uh, and it, I really enjoyed it when I first read it. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in to our first chapter here. Chapter 1 is called Three Deliveries. On a warm October night in Chicago, three deliveries were made in the same neighborhood. A plump tangerine moon had just risen over Lake Michigan. The doorbell had been rung at each place and an envelope left propped outside. Each front door was opened onto an empty street each of the three people who lived in those homes lived alone, and each had a hard time falling asleep that night. The same letter went out to all three. Dear friend, I would like your help in identifying a crime that is now centuries old. This crime has wronged one of the world's greatest painters. As those in positions of authority are not brave enough to correct this error, I have taken it upon myself to reveal the truth. I have chosen you because of your discriminating eye, your intelligence, and your ability to think outside of convention. If you wish to help me, you will be amply rewarded for any risks you take. You may not show this letter to anyone. Two other people in the world have received this document tonight. Although you may never meet, the three of you will work together in ways none of us can predict. If you show this to the authorities, you will most certainly be placing your life in danger. You will know how to respond. I congratulate you on your pursuit of justice. The letter was not signed, and it had no return address. The man had sat down to a late dinner. He liked to read when he ate, and he was on page four of a new novel. Book in hand, he answered the door. His spaghetti and meatballs were cold by the time he remembered them. He sat at the table for a long time, looking first at the letter, and then out at the moon. Was this a joke? Who would go to the trouble of writing and sending such a letter? It was printed on expensive stationery. The kind you buy if you want to be impressive or pretentious. Should he feel flattered? Suspicious? What did this person want from him? What kind of reward were they talking about? And who was it who knew him well enough to know he'd say yes? A woman tossed and turned in bed, her long hair trapping moonlight against the pillow. She was going over lists of names in her mind. The more she thought, the more agitated she became. She was not amused. Could this be a coincidence, or was it a clever warning? What exactly did this person know about her past? She finally got up. A cup of hot milk would calm her nerves. She moved carefully in the dark, using the watery rectangles of light that fell across the floor. She wasn't about to turn on the kitchen light. The name scrolled in tidy columns through her mind, each group belonging to a different chapter in her life. There was Milan. There was New York. There was Istanbul. But this was an invitation, not a threat. If things got strange or frightening, she could always change her mind. Or could she? Another woman lay awake under the moon, listening to the wind and the occasional whine of a police siren. This was one of the weirdest coincidences ever. Was this letter insane or inspired? And was she just being gullible, thinking this person was really writing to her? Maybe hundreds of these letters had gone out. Had her name been picked out of a phone book? Fake or not, the letter was intriguing. A centuries-old crime. What could this person be planning? What about the spooky part? If you show this to the authorities, you will most certainly be placing your life in danger. Maybe this was a maniac, one of those serial killers. She pictured the police going through her apartment and finding the letter, standing over her body and saying, Geesh, she should have called us first thing. She could have been alive today. A lone cat yowled in the alley below her bedroom, and she jumped, her heart pounding. Sitting up in bed, she shut the window and locked it. How could she not say yes? This was a letter that could alter history. Chapter 2. The letter is dead. 
The letter is dead. It was a strange thing for a teacher to say. By the sixth week of sixth grade, Miss Hussey still wasn't a disappointment. She had announced on the first day of school that she had no idea what they were going to work on that year, or how. It all depends on what we get interested in, or what gets interested in us, she added, as if this was obvious. Calder Pillay was all ears. He had never heard a teacher admit that she didn't know what she was doing. Even better, she was excited about it. Mrs. Hussey's classroom was in the middle of the school building at the university school in the neighborhood known as Hyde Park. The school sat on the edge of the University of Chicago campus. John Dewey, an unusual professor, had started, at it, had started it a century earlier as an experiment. Dewey believed in doing, in working on relevant projects in order to learn how to think. Calder had always liked the man's appropriate name. Not all teachers at the U, as it was called, still agreed with Dewey's ideas, but Miss Hussey obviously did. They began the year by arguing about whether writing was the most accurate way to communicate. Petra Andali, who loved to write, said it was. Kids like Calder, who hated it, said it wasn't. What about numbers? What about pictures? What about plain old talking? Miss Hussey had told them to investigate. They took piles of books out of the library. They found out about cave art in France, about papyrus scrolls in Egypt, about Mayan petroglyphs in Mexico, and about stone tablets from the Middle East. They tried things. They made stamps out of raw potatoes and covered the walls with symbols. They invented a sign language for hands and feet. They communicated for one whole day using nothing but drawings. Now, it was almost mid-October. Would they ever study regular subjects like the other classes did? Calder didn't care. What they were doing was real exploration, real thinking, not just finding out about, not just finding out about what a bunch of dead famous grown-ups believed. Miss Hussey was cool. D-E-A-D, -D. she had written it on the board. They were talking about letters that morning because Calder had groaned about having to write a thank you note and said that it was always a waste of time. No one cared what you put in a letter. Then Miss Hussey asked if anyone in the class had ever received a truly extraordinary letter. No one had. Miss Hussey looked very interested. They had ended up with a strange assignment. Let's see what you can find, Miss Hussey began. Ask an adult to tell you about a letter they will never forget. I'm talking about a piece of mail that changed their life. How old were they when they got it? Where were they when they opened it? Do they still have it? Petra, like Calder, was fascinated by their new teacher. She loved Miss Hussey's questions and her long ponytail and the three rings in each ear. One earring had a small pearl dangling from a moon, another a high-heeled shoe the size of a grain of rice, another a tiny key. Petra loved how Miss Hussey listened carefully to the kids' ideas and didn't care about right and wrong answers. She was honest and unpredictable. She was close to perfect. Miss Hussey suddenly clapped her hands, making Petra jump and setting the little pearl earring into orbit. I know. Once you find a letter that changed a life, sit down and write me a letter. Write me a letter I won't be able to forget. Petra's mind was already racing. Calder pulled a pentomino piece out of his pocket. It was an L. He grinned. L for letter. This letter was definitely not dead. L was one of the simplest pentomino shapes to use. Most letters, the kind you mailed, were rectangles, he realized, just like an accurately put together pentomino solution. L was also the twelfth letter in the alphabet and one of the twelve pentominoes. Today was the twelfth day of October. Calder's grandmother had once told him that he breathed patterns the way other people breathed air. Calder sighed. If only thoughts didn't have to be broken down into words. Too much talk was hard to listen to and writing, for him, was a brutal process. So much got left behind. Miss Hussey ended the class by saying, Got it? First find, then do. Who knows where this will take us? Calder and Petra lived on Harper Avenue, a narrow street next to the train line. Their houses were three blocks away from the U School and three houses away from each other. They often passed on the street, but they had never been friends. Families came from all over to study or teach at the University of Chicago, and many of them lived in this part of Hyde Park. Since most parents worked, young kids traveled on their own around the campus and to and from school. On the afternoon of October 12th, Petra walked home from school with Calder half a block ahead of her. She watched him fish around for his key and open his front door. She knew his pockets were full of puzzle pieces. He sometimes muttered things and always looked like he had just woken up. He was kind of weird. 
Scuffing through the first fall leaves, Petra drifted into the game she often played with herself. Ask a question that doesn't have an answer. Why was Yellow cheerful, she wondered, and why was it always a surprise, even when it came in an ordinary shape, like a lemon or an egg yolk? Picking up a yellow leaf, she held it in front of her face. Maybe she would write to Miss Hussey about this. She'd asked her if she agreed that humans needed questions more than answers. Calder, at that moment, looked out his front window to see Petra walking by holding a leaf several inches from her nose. He knew he was kind of weird, but she was exceptionally weird. She was always by herself at school and didn't seem to care. She was quiet when other kids were loud. Plus, she had a fierce triangle of hair that made her look like one of those Egyptian queens. Calder wondered if he was becoming just as much of an oddball. No one had asked him what he was doing after class that day. No one had told him to wait. He'd taken his buddy Tommy's presence for granted. Not now. Tommy Segovia had lived across the street from Calder until this past August. They had been great friends since second grade when Tommy poured his chocolate milk on Calder's bare legs and asked him how it felt. A teacher rushed over, and Calder had explained that it was an experiment, and that it felt just perfect. That was the first of many collaborations. He and Tommy had decided back in July that they weren't going to be mediocre kids. They swore that they were going to do something important with their lives, solve a great mystery, or rescue somebody, or be so smart in school that they'd skip grades. That was the same day Calder had received his first set of pentominoes. A cousin in London had sent them as a 12th birthday present, even though Calder's birthday wasn't until the end of the year. The pentominoes were yellow plastic and clacked against the kitchen table in a satisfying, decisive way. Determined, Calder moved the shapes into one combination after another, flipping and turning them. The biggest rectangle he had put together so far was six pieces. A breeze was coming in the back door, and some morning doves that had nested on the back porch were cooing, making that slippery, burbling sound that Calder always associated with summer in his neighborhood. Every detail of that morning with Tommy was strangely clear. At once, Calder had known what to do. The Y had to slide into the U, which had to fit next to the P. He even remembered the sequence of letters. Yup. He had gotten his first 12-piecer, and gotten it fast. When he looked up afterward, he saw the pentomino shapes echoed in the kitchen. The hinges on the cabinets were L's. The water faucets were X's. The burners on the stove stood up on, N, on neat N legs. Maybe the entire world could be communicated in some kind of pentomino code. Kind of like a Morse code. He knew at that moment that he would be a great problem solver. Or so he told Tommy, who punched him in the arm and told him that he had had a swelled head. Yup, he said with a grin. Calder's head didn't feel too swelled these days. He looked at the clock. He was already late. When Tommy moved away, Calder had taken over his job at Powell's and used books. Calder helped out one afternoon a week now, delivering books in the neighborhood or unloading boxes. With Tommy gone, it was something to do. Calder gulped a glass of chocolate milk, stuffed a cookie in each cheek, and set off at a run. Powell's was one of Petra's favorite places. It was peaceful, and you never knew what you might find. It looked more like a warehouse than a store. Books were piled everywhere, and the rooms were jumbled together in a mismatched way. Although Petra had been inside many times, it always felt like a labyrinth. One dimly lit area led to the next, and suddenly you were back where you started without knowing how you got there. No one asked if you needed help. No one frowned if you read but didn't buy. Petra's mom had sent her to get milk and bread at the grocery store around the corner. Powell's was on the way. Petra had just settled herself on a footstool with a copy of Kidnapped when she saw a long ponytail whip by. Miss Hussey? Petra stood up carefully. She peeked around the corner, ready to pretend to look surprised. And there was no one in sight. Petra looked across rows of cookbooks. She tiptoed carefully through the next room, past English, history, psychology, and pets. She only wanted to see what Miss Hussey was reading. Darn. The next person she saw was Calder. He was bending over a box of books, a piece of paper in his hand. Don't turn around. Don't you dare turn around, Petra thought. She didn't want anyone from the class to see her spying. She tiptoed around the next corner. Miss Hussey was crouched by the art books. Petra couldn't see what she was looking at, but she noticed several paperbacks next to her on the floor. Agatha Christie, Raymond Chandler. Miss Hussey moved suddenly, and Petra jumped backwards. To her surprise, Calder was right behind her. He had obviously seen what she was doing. Petra cupped her hand quickly as if to cover his mouth, 
but stopped before she touched him. They looked equally shocked. Calder, recovering first, peered around the corner. He ducked back in a flash. She's coming! It felt too late to do anything but hide, so they hurried out of history and into fiction. Miss Hussey was at the front desk now. She plopped down her books and began talking to Mr. Watch, the man with red suspenders who was usually at the cash register. They were laughing. Did they know each other? Can you see what she has? Petra whispered. Calder walked quietly, quickly behind their teacher, his eyes on the counter. Miss Hussey never turned her head. Murder and a big art book? Never something? He muttered to Petra when he returned. Miss Hussey left the store with her purchases. A moment later, Petra ducked outside, empty-handed, her cheeks burning. She was furious with herself. Powell's has always been her private hideaway, her refuge. Now she'd spoken to Calder there. She'd practically attacked him. And he'd seen her spying on Miss Hussey. What had she started? Um, and that's where we're going to stop today. Uh, we'll come back tomorrow uh, for Chapter 3, uh, which is called Lost in the Art. I hope you are enjoying our book, Chasing Vermeer, and I'll see you back tomorrow. Have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.